Well, hello everyone. I am glad to be back with you again this week studying the book of 1 John. So this week we were in 1 John chapter 2 verses 12 through 17. So if you haven't read that yet, pause the video now and read that section so it will be fresh in your mind. I'll wait for you. All right, well, welcome back. <clears throat> so this week where I personally focused my attention was on verses 12 through 14. I found John's emphasis and repetition to be very interesting. So I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that with you today. As I took a detailed look into this passage, I noticed something in the Greek that was very interesting. It was John's use of the words we have translated here as children. In verse 12, John starts off by saying, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Now, John uses the Greek word here, technion. That word does mean children or offspring. But it's also used in the New Testament as a term of kind address by teachers to their disciples. The pupils or disciples were called children by their teachers. This is because the teacher's job was to give instruction. The teacher's job was to nourish the mind of the student and help mold their character. You could be any chronological age and be someone's pupil or disciple. It just meant that you were learning from that person. And John uses this word technion and its various roots several times in the book of 1 John. You can look up those instances for yourself. But every time John uses the word, it seems like it's in connection with our standing in Jesus. Either the advocacy of Jesus, the forgiveness Jesus offers, the righteousness of Jesus, even as an example of the way Jesus walked or the truth we find in Jesus. The context of John's usage of the word technion or little children seems to indicate that first John is referring to children as people who believe in Jesus, believers. But in verse 2, 13, John switches to a different word for children. It's the word pideon. So this word is also translated as child, but it's more often used of an infant or a very young child, a child recently born, which led me to the question, why does John make this switch? Why does he use a different word for child in this particular section? Well, most commentators believe it's because he was moving or shifting from talking about to salvation to now talking about sanctification or the maturing process. John picks up an analogy here. He talks about a child, a young man, and a father. He's giving us an analogy of growth. And it's something that we're all familiar with, the growth of a baby through youth and ultimately into the role of a parent. The characteristic of a child or an infant is that he or she is immature. They know very little about the world and they need our protection and training. The characteristic of a young man is that he has some knowledge and he's learning to use that knowledge in the real world. And finally, the characteristic of a father is that he has transferred his knowledge into wisdom. He's responsible for children of his own, and he can teach or pass down a legacy. That's the kind of progression we see um, in human nature. And our spiritual growth, our spiritual maturity is the same. We come to Christ and we are essentially new to the faith. We, knew ve we know very little of the teachings of Jesus. We're just glad that we've been forgiven and restored. And now begins, if we are willing, our spiritual growth process. 
As young believers, we begin to dig into God's re revelation of himself through the word, the Bible. We learn of his character and his teaching. We co become convicted of our sin and let the word of God change us. We are growing in our character. We are trading in selfishness for selflessness, pride for humility, misery for joy. We're trading impatience for patience, rebellion for obedience, hatred for love, wickedness for goodness. We're no longer living in faithlessness, but faithfulness. We're trading cruelty for kindness, dissatisfaction for contentment. Anxiety turns into peace, and indulgence changes into self-control. And the outcome of that growth is that we mature into a person who now has wisdom, a person who can teach others and pass down a legacy of faith. So in John's words, the child or infant in Christ knows the father. That's the foundation point. The young man has overcome the evil one. He's strong, and the word of God is living in him. This growing believer is learning about God and putting those lessons into practice in everyday life. And the, the father, or the mature Christian, knows the one who is from the beginning. Now, that's interesting, because isn't the one who is from the beginning also the father? That led me to ask, what's the difference between the child knowing the father and the mature believer knowing the one who is from the beginning? It seems to me that John is taking us all the way back to the book of Genesis with that statement, kind of like he did in the first chapter of his gospel. The mature Christian knows the father just like the child does. But the mature Christian has studied God's character from the very beginning of God's word. The mature Christian has plunged into the depths of God's nature, his eternality, his triune nature. The mature believer has a broader understanding of who God is. The key is that spiritual maturity begins with God and continues to be centered on God. John is saying that spiritual maturity is God-focused. Now, I love the distinction that John MacArthur makes when he talks about this process of spiritual maturity. Listen to what he says. So, I think when we talk about spiritual growth, we need to kind of clear the deck of some of the misconceptions. Spiritual maturity has nothing to do with our standing before God. That's fixed. It has nothing to do with God's love for you. That's established for eternity. It has nothing to do with time. There are people who have been Christians a very long time, and they're not mature. There are people who have been Christians a short time, and they're progressing rapidly toward maturity. It has nothing to do with information, even biblical information, because you can have information that's not really applied to your life. It has nothing to do with activity. Busyness doesn't equate to spiritual maturity. It has nothing to do with prosperity or temporal success or material benefit or the size of ministry. Level of influence is not necessarily a measure of one's maturity. Well, I'm glad MacArthur makes those um, misconceptions clear to us because we can easily think that our maturity is based on these things. MacArthur goes on to say that spiritual maturity is in knowing God as much as possible in the same way that Christ knows him. That is to say, may I know him accurately to be who he really is. And in that knowledge comes the essence of worship in my life. Isn't that beautiful? So I guess the question we must all ask of ourselves is this. Where are we along the continuum of spiritual maturity?
You know, Job 32.9 says, The abundant in years may not be wise. Are we a child, a young adult, or a maturing believer? And then the next question would be, what are we doing to continue our maturing process? The good news is we all have room to grow. Thanks for joining us this week, and I'll see you next time.